Good morning, everyone. It's 10.33. Um, I guess we can start now. Welcome, everyone, to the PLC Transformation Programs webinar entitled Guidebook 5 Highlights. Um, so we'll have three sessions for today's webinar. Session number one, I'll be covering on the objective of the PLCT program, progress and status. Next, we'll have our partners from PwC who will walk us through about guidebook number five, the final and fifth guidebook under the uh, published guidebooks of the PLCT program. And last but not least, after the conclusion of the guidebook, we'll have a Q&A session. So for today's this webinar, the objective is, there are three objectives of this session. Number one is to provide participants with a deeper understanding in how PLCs can play a role in nation building. Number two, to bring to life through sharing of relevant case studies, various real life examples and key takeaways. And last but not least, to share key implementation considerations and actionable items to assist PLCs in the nation building journey. So for those who are not yet aware uh, or are still a bit unfamiliar with the PLC transformation program, just to give a bit of an overview, uh, the PLC transformation program aims to drive medium to long-term corporate reform and performance with the following objectives. Number one, to address lackluster perform corporate performance. To uh, we want to also strengthen the growth narrative of PLCs of all sizes. And last but not least, we want to create a more attractive marketplace for domestic and foreign investors alike. So Bursa Malaysia, we are spearheading this program and what we did was in 2022, we published five guidebooks that acts to help provide a guideline on best practice guidelines to PLCs to adopt and implement in the hopes of addressing these three main objectives. Uh, we did, we published the first guidebook in January, which is guidebook number one on purpose and performance driven, number two e on ESG, number three is on stakeholder management, number four on digitally enabled, and last but not least, the guidebook number five, which is on contributing to a station building. So underpinning or supporting these programs, uh, we are also monitoring the PRC's adoption, those who are participating in this program. We are monitoring the efforts and progress via our digital dashboard. So for today's webinar, we have with us our partners from PwC. Uh, we have uh, Marina Chemokta, she's a partner from PwC Malaysia, uh, who, also in, who is also in the economics and policy team. Supporting her is Brenda Cha and Daniel Farid, who are also from the economics and policy team. So um, without wasting any more time, Marina, please take us through the guidebook number five. Thank you very much, Ali. Uh, Assalamualaikum and a very good morning to everybody who's here today. Thanks again for attending uh, this webinar session. So as mentioned by Ali, the objective of today's webinar is for me to bring you through Lightbook 5, which is made available in Bursa's website uh, for you to download and for you to make a reference. So in the Guidebook 5 itself, uh, there are six main chapters that are being covered. Uh, this was launched in 5th of December uh, last year. The six chapters uh, mainly cover the approach that you are taking towards what nation building is in the lens of how PLCs can play a role in contributing towards nation building and how does it create value to nation building, both not just for the company, but also for the nation itself. And we cover three key value creation areas and in its areas of its imperatives, which my colleague Brenda and Daniel will cover later on. We also use uh, cover it in a chapter six, the implementation considerations, because uh, what's important is this is meant to be a guidebook, not an academic exercise. So there are you know examples and considerations and challenges that the PLCs need to think about uh, when applying some of these concepts. In the guidebook itself, uh, like I mentioned, it has implementation considerations, practice aids, as well as guidance areas. Again, use certain checklists because I know some of the PLCs have already started embarking in this journey, but you know what more can be done and how more deliberate can be And because this is an e-guidebook, um, there are also links to video interviews from prominent leaders that you can watch a bit like a mini podcast. There are case studies and lessons that you can learn, not just from the local PLCs, but also from the global company. Um, research and statistics, again, can be useful for your reference. And uh, these are some of the areas that we are looking at. So without further ado, I'll bring you through to the first chapter. The first chapter basically introduced the approach towards nation building. 
And we know that there are global mega trends that are pushing for major long-term shifts, such as aging population, climate change, and erosion of social cohesion. All these pose uncertainties and threats to the people and economies. While Malaysia has seen a lot of notable success over the years, we are not spared by this urgent need for a whole of nation approach towards strengthening the country's fundamentals now to secure future resilience. Aligned with the country's aspirations you know, about us increasing our competitiveness, not only amongst our neighboring countries in ASEAN, but beyond, is also for us to achieve the high income nation uh, goal that uh, we want. And of course, towards a more sustainable and inclusive uh, nation as well. So with that, within the context of this e-guidebook and the PLC transformation program, uh, nation building here is uh, defined as a, a, where we form a country that has common interests, goals and preference, and how the private sector can play a role as a key growth driver towards a fully modernized and knowledge-based country. Again, um, Malaysian government has formulated policies such as the 12 Malaysian plan, and then there are more shorter terms and there are the specific policies that are within the government. But ultimately, it's to promote sustainable growth and decent standard of living for all. And anchored on these strategic directions, businesses and society can complement nation building efforts as a shared responsibility. PLCs, especially in Malaysia, given their contribution to the GDP, can contribute to nation building through respective initiatives and actions, which we will share uh, later, and it's also more details are within the guidebooks as well. Companies that invest in efforts to enhance their performance can also generate positive spillover benefits to the nation, and we are sharing, we will be sharing empirical studies and statistics on this uh, in chapter two. In chapter one as well, we've covered uh, a framework that shows a, a holistic approach towards nation building. And essentially, this is how the guidebook has been written and being framed uh, throughout the six chapters. We define what are the desired outcomes for the nation. And then we talk about what are the key attributes of the nation building, the key drivers that play a role in nation building, who are the government, business, society, the benefits that nation building has to the PLCs, and how can PLCs play a role in nation building in the three key value creation areas in, and in the imper key imperatives and the implementation considerations that PLC need to take? I think there is no uh, doubt that when it comes to how we define the desired outcome for the nations, all of us strive to have a higher economic growth with increased competitiveness, which talk about the prosperity of the nation. All of us would want a meaningful job opportunities for the people. We talk about improving welfare and standards of living for the society, sustainable and inclusive practices, being a low carbon resource efficient economy is also very important. And this also has been covered in book two of the PLC transformation guidebook series. And most importantly, a strengthened governance and public confidence. Because at the end of the day, nothing is built um, I know trust is really important, not just trust in the institutions, but also PLCs and us as a society. So I'll bring you through to the next attributes. When we talk about the nation building attributes, based on our research, these are the critical aspects of nation building. It relates to a lot of the country's macro fundamentals. And by strengthening these nation building attributes, there are many outcomes that the Malaysia can benefit from, uh, which I have articulated much earlier. There's five attributes that we have covered here is basically one, we talk about having a more diversified economic structure. It's important for us to shift towards multiple sources. And I think we can see that our country is trying to move on just relying on the resource-based economy, but towards the knowledge base and a more diversified economic structure. We talk about Productive capabilities, productivity and efficiency is key in the growth of the country. And how do we strengthen the limited resource and capacity that we have? And what is our role in producing the right capabilities? Thirdly, is the people. Nurturing a competent workforce to be quality and agile talent pool 
and also to manage the industry needs and the global mega trends that are facing us is highly important and PLCs play a role, not just the government. Fourth, as I mentioned earlier, is to have a more sustainable and inclusive practice because we're not just improving the high, the income of the country and the economic growth for today, but it's also how we secure the future's resilience. And finally, how can we shape the public and private sector organizations to be a better trusted institutions that are transparent, accountable, and responsible towards all their stakeholders? The next part of the framework highlights the key drivers of nation building. Nation building, again, as I mentioned, is a shared responsibility between government, businesses, and society. Government plays a role in formulating the policies and regulations, and you know, businesses can also participate in this um, policy formulation exercise, which we'll be covering in one of the value creation areas. Us as societies hold the businesses and government accountable and advocates for the needs uh, that are for the betterment of the society. And to achieve some of these goals set in Malaysia, uh, businesses can complement these uh, nation building efforts and PLCs especially can contribute to nation building through a respective initiatives and actions. They not only contribute towards a sustainable and vibrant economy, you know, through the upskilling, reskilling, uh, building of talent pool, this can help build an inclusive, equitable society and how the PLCs can build for an foster a more effective PPPs. Here, I would like to highlight an example of how it works. I think we all know, we've been talking about it quite a bit, how South Korea has succeeded to be a high income nation, but it's not just because of the government policies, but how the companies themselves uh, leverage on you know, some of the new industrial policies and trade openness in terms of investment in talent, investment in R&D, as well as collaboration with the local universities, as well as startups and social enterprise, which have created not just uh, having more capital coming into the country, but there are more startups, SMEs that begin to emerge in the last few years, as well as you know, growing towards becoming a high income nation. So with that, I'll pass it on to my colleague, Brenda, to bring us through the next uh, chapter. All right. Um, thank you, Marina. Uh, good morning, everyone. So uh, Marina just shared what nation building is and its attributes. Uh, why is it important and who can be in the driver's seat? And that includes influential businesses like PLCs. Then comes another set of important questions, um, which we seek to answer in Chapter 2. Um, with the influence that PLCs have, uh, how can PLCs create value both for themselves and the country in their nation building journey? And second, what areas can PLCs contribute in? So let me start off by answering the first question with this chart right here. Now, building a nation is not a zero-sum game. When we strengthen nation-building attributes, such as building a quality talent pool or accelerating adoption of sustainable practices, we can create meaningful jobs and compete better. And these outcomes shape a conducive environment uh, for companies to thrive and create value for themselves. So to this end, uh, PLCs can benefit in four ways. Uh, if you look at uh, the chart on the right, um, supply chain resilience, steady talent retention and pipeline, strengthen trust and reputation, and more importantly, um, improving business performance. So as PLCs build further on these um, as part of their nation building efforts, the outcomes from these efforts will simply reinforce the benefits to the nation, uh, thus creating a continuous virtuous cycle. So what role can PLC play in nation building? Broadly, there are three areas of value creation that PLCs can play a direct role in. Uh, so in the context of this guidebook, first, sustaining economic growth and productivity. What we really talk about is to focus on adopting um, advanced, collaborative, and capacity-building approach um, to strengthen business efficiency and agility. Second, it's about cultivating future readiness, well-being, and inclusion of talent. So we talk about fostering a workforce that meets industry's needs and also ensuring fair and equitable labor treatment. 
Third, fostering stronger public-private partnerships or PPP. I'm really focusing on maximizing synergies and entering ethical practices in the interactions between the public and the private sector. Now, under these value creation areas, there are actually nine imperatives, but in this webinar, we will just focus on a few and um, highlight some interesting insights in the guidebook uh, later in this session. Okay, so um, just before we proceed to the next value creation area, we actually have a quick poll for all of you. Um, a very simple question, does nation building resonate with your company's vision and mission? So what you can do is just quickly scan the QR code uh, on the screen, or uh, you can also go to slido.com and just enter the code uh, hashtag nation uh, building. Okay, so we'll just give you a, a bit of time to just scan and get your phones up. Okay, I see one response there. We have uh, over 40 participants today. Okay, good to see it's a resounding yes at the moment. Let's try to get about half of the people at least perhaps. Okay, nice. Almost there. Oh, interesting. Some not at the moment. Okay. All right, so we have about half of uh, the participants at least. Uh, Interesting. So, so many have said yes. So that's great. Some also say somewhat. Uh, maybe you know, to a different extent, through CSR initiatives or um, government policies and and plans. Not at the moment. There's also seven percent. So we see that you know across different companies, um, there are different uh, alignment to to uh, nation building. Uh, uh, efforts. So I think uh, the takeaway really is about, you know, looking at company strategic direction going forward and how best can you further enhance. Uh, and if you haven't already started, how can you then get started? So that's what this guidebook is all about, to help you get started and improve further in terms of um, nation building efforts. Okay. Thank you very much for participating in the poll. Okay. So um, as mentioned just now, we have three uh, value creation areas. Let's delve a little deeper into the first area of value creation for PLCs, that's sustaining economic growth and productivity. Now we hear these uh, terms very often and it's a very widely talk, uh, talked about topic. In the context of this guidebook, we're focusing on three key areas, which is MSME development, uh, RDC and I activities, that's research development, commercialization and innovation activities, and third, um, digitalization and technology partnerships. So today I'll just focus on the first two imperatives. Now, some of you might wonder why these areas. Um, so we looked at some empirical studies and they've shown that you know, innovation proxied by R&D investments, along with the adoption of new technologies are actually common contributors to productivity growth. But what's even more important is that we talk about technological improvements, the effects can actually be amplified through a production chain. Now, this is where um, MSME participation comes into the picture. So in our first M imperative, we talk about MSME development. Now MSME, uh, you may or may not be aware, but have a sizable presence in the Malaysian economy, whether it's in terms of GDP contribution or uh, employment. But the thing is, MSME continue to face certain challenges uh, in moving up the value chain and to penetrate the global market. Now, this is due to uh, some factors such as limited access to financing or also insufficient know-how. Now, they can improve their productivity and know-how, and one way for them is to strengthen their network with larger companies like PLCs. So to this end, PLCs can help simply by getting more of them to be part of your business operations, in particular, your supply chain. And by doing these, PLCs actually stand to benefit. So your question could be how, right? Um, so getting more local MSMEs to be part of uh, PLC's supply chain can spur higher demand for goods and services. It's because if you look at the buy local sentiments, it has only grown stronger uh, both globally and locally. And secondly, PLCs will also have more control over um, 
their production inputs with shorter lead times. And this is also echoed by the Asia Pacific Economic Cooperation. So take UMW, for example, uh, a case study that we have in the book. Uh, as part of their cost optimization strategy, they actually increase local sourcing. So about half of their vendors are local, and they actually spend about half of their procurement budget on them. And the resulting impact is that they saw improved margins, they face um, lesser currency risks, and at the same time, they help um, their local vendors go uh, penetrate the uh, export market. Okay, so some practical steps uh, with more details in the book, but broadly here, there are four things. Um, looking at holistic supply chain analysis, really, how can you map opportunities for MSME along the value chain? Second, assessing benefits and hurdles of local sourcing. Third, establishing partnerships with local entities to solve hurdles. And fourth, developing local capacities and capabilities of MSME. So here's a case in point uh, to just illustrate some of these. Farm Fresh Burhat. Very interesting. So they set up a um, nationwide wide multi-channel distribution network and who they worked with were the local communities, including rural micro-entrepreneurs, homemakers, and also local farmers. And the impact there are twofold. Um, one, in terms of incomes, right? They generate 134 million ringgit for micro-entrepreneurs, of which 80% are women, right? So we just had International Women's Day uh, last week, and also 3.2 million ringgit for farmers. And on a broader scale, uh, we see that, you know, Farm Fresh is aligning themselves uh, to achieve the 100% self-sufficiency level in local fresh milk production by 2025 in Malaysia. So here we see that MSME development has helped with Farm Fresh's supply chain in terms of distribution, and it also benefits the local entrepreneurs and communities. So there are more case studies like these that you can really refer in the book, uh, actually throughout the book. Okay. Now, moving on to the next imperative, which is the RDCNI activities. Um, this has always been an important element for driving growth and productivity, and even more so in a very fast changing and competitive market now. So in recent years, if you look at the chart on the left, Malaysia's global innovation index ranking has been declining. And while the country aims to be in the top 20 uh, by 2025, we also observe certain things. Um, if you look at the chart on the right, at the national level, R&D expenditure has been broadly falling since 2016. And if you look at, at the local level, uh, R&D commercialization rate in uh, local public universities was only 4.3% in 2019 due to insufficient market knowledge and network. So national targets have been set uh, to increase R&D expenditures in the 12 Malaysia plan, but we can only reach there and maximize the benefits if we intensify efforts in these areas. So um, it is in every interest of businesses to embark on you know, RDCI initiatives to stay relevant. Now, this is a video that we actually featured in the guidebook, um, which is an interesting one, but so we've extracted a few key takeaways. Um, so this example looks like the Global Innovation 1000 study. It investigates the trends at the world's 1000 largest corporate R&D spenders. And collectively, these companies uh, account for 40% of the world's R&D spending in 2018. Now, just a key point on what differentiates high leverage innovators. Uh, if you can see the chart on the left, there are six, but some examples include um, innovation are done based on insights from direct end users, right? Secondly, um, leadership. They're very closely involved with innovation programs. Um, other examples include company-wide culture support. But what's important is to integrate all of the above six elements to be a high leverage innovator. So key point here is that it's not about just throwing in the money into RDCI, right? It's about building capabilities, your talent, culture, and processes to get the bang for your buck. Now, the impact from that is that the chart on the right, companies had, uh, these companies had sales growth 2.6 times and market cap 2.9 times as high as other companies on the Global Innovation 1000 list. Okay, so some steps to accelerate RDCNI. Um, a few points here again. Uh, assess gaps and pain points to guide RDCI strategies. So that's really just aligning your business strategies to national strategies. And secondly, identifying innovation approach, you know, whether it's incremental and gradual sort of innovation versus disruptive and breakthrough innovation. 
Third is collaborating with local institutions. There are many ways you can collaborate, but one key thing is to solve the commercialization issue that we mentioned just now. And what PLCs can do is really to provide go-to-market um, insights or also industry insights to help make them relevant. And last but not least is creating a conducive environment. So we talk about you know, having an innovative culture in your companies. Now, so if we look at Samdabi Plantation Berhad, uh, a very quick one, Locally, we also see that you know, they've benefited through collaboration with local researchers with heavy investments in agricultural R&D. So again, you know, it's not about putting in the money, only in the money, but also strengthening capabilities and processes. And as a result, they improved uh, their production yield by 15%. Okay. So, you know, um, we, we have a lot of imperatives. We can strive to do diverse things under these imperatives, but ultimately impact matters. We want to be able to measure and demonstrate them beyond financial matrices that we're so familiar with, right? And particularly in an environment where, you know, stakeholders demand and expectations are high. So in this book, what we have done is that we have mapped uh, these imperatives to key matrices that PLCs can use at the company level. And you can also see how they link to the macro indicators uh, of the country. So a very some quick examples, when we say local suppliers, it's not. Uh, it's the number of local MSME uh, onboarded as your suppliers. Secondly, uh, collaboration with local institutions. So it's not just the number of collaboration here, but the rate of successful collaborations with local R&D institutions. And another example could be digital adoption. What's the degree of engagement with and utilization of specific digital technology? It could or could not include the chat GPT and all that, you know, with the recent trends. But yeah, it's according to the context of your companies. So um, just to conclude this chapter, um, PLCs tend to benefit from these initiatives under these imperatives. It can help you scale, help you mitigate risk and remain competitive and relevant. And importantly, while also driving nation building efforts. OK. Yeah, so that's um, the end of chapter uh, three. So I'll now hand over to Daniel to bring you through the remaining value creation areas. Thank you. Hi, Daniel. Sorry to jump in. Um, we can't hear you, sorry. Do you mind just checking your audio, your microphone? Or it's still not working for some reason. Yeah, hello. Can you hear me now, Ali? Yes, now it was fine. Right. Okay. Um, apologies um to the participants today for the minor technical glitch. Okay, um, so now uh, we'll go into the next uh, area of uh, value creation. Uh, again, as I was saying, thank you to those um, who are still with us uh, today. Um, as we are halfway through the webinar. So for the next area of value creation, we'll go into cultivating future readiness, well-being, and inclusion of talent. So this chapter of the book outlines how PLCs can support nation building by addressing the future readiness of the workforce and the importance of nurturing the well-being of the employees. At the same time, this also highlights the importance and benefits of embracing DEI in the workplace. However, for the purpose of today's webinar, we'll be highlighting the first two imperatives, which is upskilling and reskilling the workforce, as well as employee wellness and well-being. Uh, for further details, of course, uh, you can uh, feel free to flip through the guidebook, which is available on Bursa's website. Um, okay, so the 12th Malaysia plan highlighted the need for talent development to support the country's shift towards high value added and knowledge based economic activities. In addition, of course, this should be complemented with DEI and well being policies. So, to nurture a future ready workforce, upskilling and reskilling efforts must be accelerated. Skills enhancements are estimated to lift global productivity by 3% on average and contribute to a net creation of 
5.3 million new jobs by 2080. This was um, a stat um, published by World Economic Forum. And um, what we notice here in Malaysia is that skill mismatch remains a key concern among employers affecting employability of workers to meet industry demands. To address this concern, the 12 Malaysia plan aims to increase the share of skilled workforce by 35% by 2025. Apologies, um, just one moment. Yep. PLCs will directly contribute towards this target by intensifying efforts to upskill and reskill the workforce. One such example that we have um, shown in our guidebook is uh, by Maybank, which is an effort to um, in, uh, upskill the workforce Force to take on greater responsibilities in the future. Uh, the program that we have highlighted is the Maybank so Workplace Enabler. Uh, this program is an eight-month training program equip, which equips employees with relevant skills to thrive in the workplace. As at April of last year, 93% of Maybank's uh, non-clerical employees have completed the program and over 360 non-clerical employees across uh, Maybank Malaysia operations have benefited from the program. And the following highlights uh, approaches that PLCs can adopt in their strategies to upskill and reskill their workforce. Um, this include assessing skill gaps and anticipate future trends, uh, develop training programs, uh, de tra develop training development programs, enhance collaboration with learning institutions, as well as provide scholarships uh, and internship opportunities. Uh, again, in this guidebook, we have um, highlighted um, another spotlight uh, by Prudential Assurance Malaysia under their Pru Kasi Entrepreneurship Program. So uh, this is a seven-month training program uh, to help uh, participants and invite them to pitch their idea and selected participants will receive equipment grants to help them kick start their business. This is in partnership with INSCAN, which is the National Entrepreneurship Institute. Um, in 2021, 18 graduates of this program were able to embark on a journey with INSCAN. So moving on to the next uh, imperative, which is employee wellness and well-being. So a bit of a background, uh, in Malaysia, there are 29 legislation related to labor market, uh, which is around discrimination in the workplace and workers' rights, and 18 ratified international labor organization conventions. Uh, compliance with these standards and regulations is important to sustain economic growth and safeguard the nation's foreign trade relationship. And adherence to these labor standards will strengthen trust in the company and this should be complemented with good governance and robust well-being measures to ensure that employees are safe, healthy, engaged, and fulfilled. Um, an example that we have shown here, um, <clears throat> which shows that there is a positive correlation between companies that have workplace well-being and wellness initiative and their overall performance. The primary measure that uh, of well-being in the study that um, on the right hand side of your screen uh, is satisfaction with the organization as a place to work importantly higher customer loyalty and productivity as well as lower staff turnover are reflected in higher profitability for the firm Thanks, Lynn. so here uh, shows that following uh, which are essential in safeguarding the employees' wellness and well-being uh, in company, uh, which could lead to growth in the Malaysian Wellbeing Index. Uh, this includes uh, assessing critical needs of employees, um, co-develop initiative and programs to promote wellness and well-being, as well as promote a shift towards a culture of health. On your right hand side of your screen, what we show is the COOP Award, which is conferred annually by the Health Project to recognize companies with outstanding work site health promotion and improvement programs. Um, the findings from this uh, award shows that between 2000, the year 2000 and the year 2014, the winner's stock value appreciated by 325% compared with the market average appreciation of 105%. <clears throat> Again, uh, similar to what was uh, presented in the earlier area of education, uh, below are some examples of matrix that PLCs can use to measure their impact on initiative related to upskilling and reskilling of the workforce. Uh, this, uh, and this also includes employee wellness and also DI agenda. These matrix are linked to nation building indicators and can be used internally to track progress or externally for reporting, which includes in um, your annual reports, for example. Uh, again, this is elaborated much uh, more um, in detail for each of the matrix in our guidebook. Uh, please, again, uh, 
do flip through our guidebook as it provides very uh, detailed explanation for each of these metrics. Um, for example, for upskilling and reskilling, uh, we look at measures to extend and the outcome of talent development programs. And for DI, uh, we measure the breadth and depth of DI in the workplace. So now I'll be moving on to the next um, area of value creation, which is um, fostering stronger public-private uh, partnerships. This chapter outlines how PLCs can forge stronger partnerships with the public sector to support nation building efforts. Leveraging the expertise and resources of the private sector, PPP can bring about new technology innovation, grow local capabilities, as well as enable resource and risk sharing. Empirical studies have shown that an increase in PPP investments to GDP can increase real GDP per capita growth by 0.1 percentage point on average. The positive impact is associated with higher infrastructure quality as a result of innovation and efficiency gain from PPP as well as good contract arrangements. For the purpose of today's webinar, we'll be uh, delving into participation in public policy making, which is uh, on the far left, and also ethical practices in public private partnerships. So moving into the first um, imperative, which is uh, participation in public policy making. Uh, the private sector feedback is crucial in policy making process, whereby it provides constructive dialogue with the public and businesses, can, uh, whereby it promotes transparency and accountability. At the same time, governments can better understand implementation bottlenecks so that root causes can be addressed in a clean manner. PLCs can take lead and engaging federal and state governments as well as regulators to jointly shape policies and advocate for a conducive business ecosystem in Malaysia. One such example we've shown here is the Vietnam Business uh, Forum, VBF. So just to give a bit of background, what is the Vietnam Business Forum about? So back in the 1990s, where the, when the Vietnam economy opened up to foreign investors, the VBF was launched uh, as a not for profit, not for profit, non political channel for public private dialogue. It operates uh, as a biannual forum between the government and business association, which enables the private sector to work with the government in resolving regulatory constraints that hinder the uh, country's development. The VBF also works uh, to provide research, legal analysis, uh, identification of problems, and practical solutions. So as a result, the VBF provided inputs to the policymakers to help develop a business environment that attracts investments and stimulates sustainable economic development in Vietnam. So some practical steps that can be taken to share private insights uh, shown on, your, um, on the right hand side, which is to leverage public consultation avenues, share relevant resources and develop thought leaderships uh, to drive advocacy. Again, um, all this, um, measures uh, that can be taken by companies and businesses uh, is elaborated further in our guidebook. Um, so now I'll move on to the next uh, imperative, which is ethical practices in public-private partnership. The successful implementation of PPP heavily depends on the inclusion of good ethics uh, among the partners. Good ethical practices are important to enhance the impact of PPPs in nation building, PLCs, uh, of course, should play a role in upholding ethical practices in PPPs together with the public sector. To strengthen ethical practices in PPP, eventually PLCs can adopt the following approach, which includes um, advocate public disclosure uh, through PPP life cycles. Uh, this is where disclosure of information should take place across the preparation, procurement, and contract management stages of the, con uh, of the engagement. Next is establish ethical considerations framework also to enhance standards in safety, uh, security, and sustainable development. Back to number two, PLCs can institutionalize specific areas of ethical uh, assessments prior to participation in PPP projects. Uh, this should include conducting social and environmental impact analysis, risk identification and allocation, as well as comparative assessment as, and also financial viability exercises. This brings me to the end uh, of this uh, chapter in the guidebook, whereby it shows that examples or matrix that can be used by PLCs to measure its involvement in PPP. These matrix are linked to nation building indicators and can be used to internally track progress or accidentally for reporting. So an uh, example for what was not elaborated earlier was public-private partnership projects, which measures the company's efforts in initiating and managing PPPs. 
This includes project cost overruns, quality of PPP project input, and also outcomes of PPP. Next, we'll go into the next uh, section of the guidebook, which is implementation considerations for PLCs. I'll hand over this um, section, uh, session to Marina. Thank you so much. Thank you very much, Daniel. Thank you very much, Daniel. And so my colleague has covered the three value creation areas and the specific imperatives. Now comes the more difficult part is how do we implement it? I think all of us know that you know, even as a country, there are a lot of policies out there, but there are always implementation challenges and priorities, and we recognize some of these challenges. In the book itself, it highlights a few challenges in terms of how do we incorporate nation building in the corporate context? How do we ensure that it's not just a corporate social responsibility or just a philanthropic gestures, but have a more deliberate view of uh, how we can incorporate nation building into the strategic corporate planning? Because as the, my colleague has shared, there are empirical evidence that, are, that creates value for the businesses itself. Secondly, we understand that there are a lot of diverse stakeholders needs and expectations that we need to uh, manage in terms of, you know, the, the classic example is yes, bottom line needs to be high. How does this in, you know investment in some of these areas like R and D? What's my ROI? That will always be the kind of pressures that management would face. And, and again, uh, what is important is how do we convey these messages and to be able to measure the impacts of this measurement to the internal and external stakeholders. And finally, is the availability of dedicated resource. It shouldn't be taught as you know either this or that, but whether we can incorporate in our uh, strategic initiatives uh, and how we can actually put in the right policies in place to ensure that whatever strategic initiatives that we're embarking are more holistic and also have benefits, not just to the company itself, but to the nation and even to your talent internally. Some of these challenges can be addressed when we look at uh, how our purpose I think in book one of the guidebook series, uh, there's a lot of uh, discussion about company's purpose and strategy. At the end of the day, yes, it needs to be profit making, but you know, what is the, the purpose of the company? What do we want to achieve at the end of the day? Secondly, it's about embedding the nation building mindset across the organization. Tone from the top is important, but we also need to recognize that, you know, these are some of the initiatives and first steps we require a whole of your company to be on board with. We talk about sufficient resources and the right organizational capabilities to navigate some of these changes as well. So in the guidebook, uh, we talk about the board of directors and the management's role uh, within the nation building. Tone from the top again is very important. We talk about the right commitment, we talk about the right priorities. And again, we're not talking about being uh, political, but about growing the economy as a whole because of that virtuous cycle that um, Brenda has highlighted and is being uh, discussed a lot in chapter two. We talk about instilling the right purpose uh, that captures the broader ambition of the business beyond profit generation and how can we actually give employees meaning in their daily work. Provide views and inputs on the overall company strategy that contributes to nation building and the accountability that the company's performance have when we start measuring uh, some of this financial and non-financial impact, which includes impact on environment and society. Again, although this has been covered quite a bit in the ESG book two of this webinar, uh, of the guidebook series, uh, some of the key metrics that my team have shared in each of the value creation areas are areas where you can start measuring and actually um, also communicate to all your internal and external stakeholders. So which leads me to my next slide. Stakeholder communication is important. Uh, of course, PLCs should seek to communicate the impact they created for the nation on a regular basis as it demonstrates the company's proactiveness and commitment to support nation building efforts. 
And this level of transparency can help to maintain trust with different stakeholder groups and greatly influence investors and public's confidence in the company. This, are, this again has linked to the futuristic value of the company itself. There are many examples of how uh, you know, progress monitoring and reporting can be done, you know, either by utilizing digital tools, frameworks and good practices, as well as you know, how do we map out companies' impact and value creation. And in terms of stakeholder engagement, there are, you know, engagement with public sector, civil society are you know, some of the opportunities which again may need may not need as much resource, but you know, can build a strong public-private partnership. And again, some of the examples within the book has shown that there are positive correlation between transparency, trust of the institution, and the value of the company, as well as the growth of the nation. The next, uh, we highlight an example of a local company which have actually embarked in some of the value creation areas in nation building. Some of it may require a lot of investment. I think some of it are part of the policy direction of the company itself in terms of how, for example, Hatta Lega have you know, localized some of its supply chain. Not only it optimizes its cost and efficiency, but you know, there is also support in terms of developing the local SME, MSME ecosystem as well. Investment in R&D as well as you know, upskilling and reskilling by working with local institutions are uh, again some of the steps that can be taken. This has actually created value for the company itself and there are benefits not just to the economy but to the uh, talent and again the society of the country. In the guidebook, we have also uh, incorporated the checklist for you because I, like I mentioned, um, PLC, there are many sizes of PLCs and this checklist helps you know, for you to take stock in terms of the initiatives that you have done, whether you have started, what can you do to do more for the country, as well as for the uh, business itself. So with that, I've come to my uh, concluding slides. Three call to actions that are very clear is in book five, the time to act is now. Look at where you are in terms of the areas of contribution towards nation building. Have a reflection on how the companies can align their purpose and objectives to these nation building initiatives. Take steps, again, uh, deliberately, not just you know, a by the way, but incorporate it into your strategic planning. How can you enhance the business ecosystem, working together with the local MSMEs, building your supply chain resilience, adopting some of this digitalization and technology advancement, which we will discuss a bit more in the Guidebook 4 webinar that is coming up. Secondly, we talk about future-proofing the talent by upskilling and reskilling the workforce. Have a clear succession planning that is embracing the DPI within uh, policies that have been mooted, not just by Bursa, but by you know, uh, globally. And of course, the impact of PPP projects. How can we maximize synergies between the public and private sector in an ethical, sustainable, and socially responsible way? And finally, what's most important, like I mentioned, tune from the top with the right resources and clear communication of the impact, not just creates value, but create a stronger trust with high level of transparency with uh, the, the different companies, the businesses, and again, um, to help with the investability of, of some of these companies. With that, um, I would like to invite uh, questions. And I can see that there are questions already being posted on the QA. Many of the recommendations are doable to companies with large budgets for smaller PLCs with stricter constraints. Do you have any suggestions how we can implement these recommendations? I think we've covered a bit uh, when I talk about implementation considerations. Even in the three value creation areas, we talk about how some of your policies can embed um, a, a clear direction in terms of your procurement policies for working together with the local MSMEs or even upskilling and reskilling, having a clear DEI policy where we promote um, you know, more diversity, more inclusiveness, and again, uh, 
make sure that employees' well-being are safeguarded to have a better succession planning. We always talk about, you know, when we train one person in a company, it might be taken out by the company, but at the end of the day, we're talking about building a greater nation, building the greater lead leaders of, of the nation. So it shouldn't be seen as, you know, either or. The second question that we have is, uh, are there any channels that PLCs can participate in public policy making? Seems like current mode is either by certain invitation or by a service. Um, yes, I think the more uh, publicly available uh, when there are invitation to workshops and focus group discussions by certain ministries as well as service, but I believe there are channels that are, are shared, uh, even in the guidebook uh, itself, we shared that there is, the, for example, um, my digital uh, corporation who works closely with the private sector to hear and help facilitate any issues that you have or any advocate uh, or policies that you have. Also, I believe that nowadays there are multiple channels, uh, even within the Malaysia Productivity Corporation, which is shared in the guidebook, uh, which is called the Unified Public Consultation, where you can actually just, you know, enter into the website and uh, post some of your ideas or even um, contribute. So again, in the guidebook, there are clear practice aids and links into how you can actually participate in public policy making. Um, and I have another question about an equivalent guidebook for SMEs. Um, again, this is part of the PLC transformation program, which aims to uh, cover as much as uh, spectrum as possible in terms of the types and size of the PLCs. Uh, but I don't think uh, Bursa will have uh, launched one for, for the SMEs. Yeah. 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 yeah, just to add on what Marina is saying, Ali from Bursa, Malaysia. Uh, we are mindful that because this project is on the PRC transformation program and it's a guidebook that's being published by Bursa. It, um, it's, we call it the PRC transformation program, but as what our CEO will always say that this guidebook is also applicable to different kinds of organizations as well. So for SMEs, you can have a look and also just uh, have a look at the guidebook as well. And you can also tailor it to how you can also implement it and, and customize it to your own uh, organization's uh, Utilization, so that that's the idea. Um, so again, it's called a piece transformation program, but it also can be applicable to SMEs as well on that part. Sorry, Marina, back to you. Thank you, Ali, for for that. I think again, uh, the the principles are similar uh, for the SMEs. Um, so again, uh, this can and then the holistic approach, the lens that I've shared in chapter one can be something that the SMEs can take on and to prioritize in terms of what initiatives that they can and not do. Uh, yes, uh, some uh, the, there was another question about specifically in the book, I uh, mentioned that PDP projects contribute to 0.1% to a national GDP. I think the source is already in the guidebook uh, itself uh, by, and the source is actually uh, by the Asian Development Bank. Thank you for that. There um, any more questions that I have? Hopefully, uh, it's clear in terms of uh, the, the book itself. Or yes, okay. There's another question. Sorry, are you ready? Okay. Uh, so the question here is about um, challenges is data collection because it's still manual. Do you offer solutions regarding a centralized platform to assist us in gathering the ESG reports? This is important to set the matrix and target qualitatively and quantitatively. Any ideas? I can't agree more that <laughs> I think there was been a lot of discussion even with Bursa when we talk about ESG that uh, data collection uh, is a challenge. Uh, you're not even talking about the data integrity yet, but the time to start is now. There are currently uh, a few platforms that are available for uh, even with PwC, not to, <laughs> to make a advertisement, but um, again, um, 
there are efforts that are being done within Bursa and Bandagara itself in terms of centralizing and to gather the correct data and to ensure that they are standardized data because at the end of the day, data integrity is also important. You don't want garbage in, garbage out. Uh, which is also why uh, with all these new disclosure standards that are coming up, uh, this will help us towards uh, being able to measure, not just in the short term, but to continuously monitor the targets uh, quantitatively as well. Because I believe that there are a lot of PLTs who have their own sustainability reporting, which are a bit more qualitative. Uh, but again, uh, given this awareness, uh, we hope to have more data from the companies itself as well. Thanks. Yes, can we have a session on succession planning? I understand we talk about talent upskilling, but succession planning is also important for nation building. I can't agree more. Actually, in the guidebook itself, uh, under chapter three, uh, there is a section on sorry, chapter four, there is a section on succession planning. As I mentioned earlier, um, succession planning, uh, building talent skills to be the next leaders. Sometimes you know, companies tend to be unsure about investing in this because you're afraid that our, your competitors might poach them. But at the end of the day, uh, it's for the nation. We want to create the leaders of tomorrow, uh, no matter where they move. And, Succession planning is important, especially included in it as well, under upskilling and reskilling. Okay, with that, I think we have only a minute left. Uh, maybe we can come to a close. I think there are uh, other avenues for them to, to come back to us. Uh, I pass it back to you, Ali. Thank you so much, Marina, for the collaborative session. Um, so. To all participants, thank you for coming in and viewing the, the, uh, the walkthrough on guidebook number five. So I think uh, PLCs, are, we, we do invite the PLC to be part of this program. It's a collective benefit that can help accelerate the achievement of a high-performing corporate Malaysia. If you are not already part of the program, um, just to understand that here are a few benefits of participating in the Peter Function Program. You'll get more data points and increased sharing of experiences to help us improve um, in ourselves. There will be more role of more targeted initiative and support efforts to help the corporates to get become more investable and help them to have ideas to improve or make they improve their corporate earnings. Uh, PLCs who improve their performance can better position themselves locally, regionally, and globally. And last but not least, and definitely to help generate sustainable gains for all stakeholders. So with that, we've come to the end of our webinar. Uh, so many thanks to everyone who have come in to be part of the session. We hope to see you again in our next webinar series. If your organization is not yet a PRCT member, you can have a look at on the left-hand side as a QR code to register as a participant. We do encourage if your organization is not yet a member of the PRCT program to be part of the program. And for those who are, are keen to know more about our guidebooks, on the right-hand side, we have with us a QR code that leads to our Bursa Malaysia's website. The five guidebooks are available publicly. So do have a look at it and implement it a bit that, that suits your organization's needs. So with that, again, thank you everyone for coming in and thank you Marina and the PwC team for making the time here today to share with us um, a bit of a piece of, of what the guidebook five entails. With that, have a good day, everyone. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.